morning, friends. Welcome to the Trinity West Seattle Families Online Gathering. I'm Matt Beckler. I'm the worship director here. It is Sunday, May 24th, which means tomorrow's Memorial Day. And next week we are into June, which is crazy for various reasons. Uh, for me, um, I have a birthday coming in a couple weeks, and I'm not going to tell you how old I'm going to turn, but it freaks me out a little bit. So um, summer's upon us. Uh, I think people are excited for warmer days and just moving forward, but there definitely is still fear in the air. Uh, I was thinking through that this morning as I was reading my Bible and just uh, thinking through what it means to be a Christian uh, and engaging fear and posing the question, is there healthy fear? And as I was reading in Proverbs chapter one, it says um, in verse seven that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. And so uh, that actually reminded me of a story as I was thinking through what that meant. Um, a story came to my mind from several years ago when I was traveling with a buddy of mine and uh, we were in the back hills of Tennessee and we ran out of gas and we had to go down this road to try to get help. And uh, we came to this house just out in the middle of nowhere and there were two huge dogs in the yard standing on the ground. They saw us, they were growling. They were not letting us near that place. And I can't tell you the whole story, but I can say that things worked out. But um, I can just remember going, all right, man, like these dogs will kill me if I go, go near them. So I respect that, I'm staying away. Now, how much more should I fear the creator of the universe and respect his position of authority? I mean, I charge at him, I insult him, I rebel yet he continues to pour his grace upon me. Today we gather to worship our God who is huge. We are small, he is mighty, and we are weak, and uh, we humble ourselves before him and worship him. Let's sing songs of worship to him right now.
So every week we gather together as God's people and we walk through the gospel narrative together. And it's great. We start off singing songs about the greatness and the holiness and the righteousness of our God. And then we move to a time of confession where we recognize that man has rebelled and is sinful. Um, I love what Jared C. Wilson says in his book, Gospel Wakefulness. He says that in order for us to fully recognize the greatness of Christ, we must first confess the bankruptcy of our own souls. That's so true. Uh, right now, I'm going to hand this off to my buddy Dustin Arneson, who's going to lead us in a corporate confession of prayer. Hi, I'm Dustin Arneson, and I serve on the worship and productions team here at Trinity West Seattle. Please join me in reading this prayer of confession. Our God, we long to know you, see you, and hear you. How we want to be holy as Christ is spotless and pure as your spirit is pure. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge our sin. We understand that apart from you, we can do nothing good. We strive to keep your statutes, but fail again and again. We fool ourselves into believing that you have our ultimate affection when we have only set up idols in your place. So what are we to do, O Lord? How can sinners such as us approach you? Please hear our cries, we turn from our sin, and confess that we need your cleansing. Bring a 
us near to God Thy sovereign power, thy healing grace And thy atoning blood Heavy is the night To Christ we Hello Trinity, it's Pastor Joel here, and I want to share with you the assurance of pardon. As we've confessed our sins to God and we're reminded of our sinfulness and our need for His grace, we share the assurance of pardon to remember that He has given us grace. And so this assurance comes from Isaiah chapter 62 verses 11 and 12. And it reminds us of really not only the fact that God has forgiven us of our sins, but that he has also saved us and made us into his people. So this is who we are in light of his grace and in light of Christ and his work. It says, Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, those are God's people, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him, and they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. And so as God's people, we are like a city that has not been forsaken. We've been built up into a fortress and a dwelling place for him. And so we get to remember uh, who we are in light of what Christ has done as we receive of communion now. And we take these elements, either the, the bread or the cracker, representing uh, Jesus' body broken for us and for the forgiveness of our sins. And we take the wine or the juice representing Jesus' blood that is shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And we remember who we are. We remember that we are in Christ and we are redeemed people. So as you receive these elements, remember what Christ has done for you in dying for you on the cross and saving you.
in you Lifeless souls awaken In you The filthy are made clean This world Broken up and tattered Through you Broken things they are redeemed I am saved from my sins I am freed from shame and guilt You took the Father's wrath Now you've taken your place That is right here And you covered me covered me with love You covered Pastor David here to give our call to give. Jesus said something very interesting about about money when he said, you cannot serve God and money. That is, you cannot serve two masters. You either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. So how do we serve and devote ourselves to God with money? Well, by bringing our finances under the Lordship of God. And one of the ways we do this is by giving of our treasures cheerfully and generously to the local church, but also to serve those who are in need all around us. Now, there are three ways for you to give to the ongoing work of Trinity. You can either mail in your check, you can either give online, or you can give through your phone by texting the number that is on the screen. I know that many of you are struggling financially, and others have even lost jobs. This past week, I was Uh, able to connect and talk with a member of our church who had lost his job um, a a while back when the stay-at-home order was implemented. But the church rallied around him. His community group um, raised funds, uh, and our church CG matching fund uh, was able to help help him during, during this time. One of our deacons even uh, helped guided him through uh, the unemployment benefits process uh, so that he was able to receive some benefits. And as an answer to prayer, um, this person um, got a new job and he'll be starting his new job uh, next week. 
Now, if you are in need of help or just need prayer, we want you to contact us and we want to come alongside of you. Now, at this time, I want to hand it over to Marie. Good morning. It's time for the passing of the peace. I thought that this morning it would be appropriate for us to think of those who have been financially and professionally impacted by the pandemic. We have several in our congregation who either work for or own small businesses, and this is an especially hard time for them right now. So if you can think of anyone that God is placing on your heart, let's pray over them today. Make sure you reach out to them. As always, remember to use the hashtag Trinity Home to Home if you're doing it on social media, or reach out to them by phone if you can. So as we give you this time to pass the peace right now, Let's reach out to them. Thanks for connecting. You say have a good Sunday? Have, have good Sunday. Mwah. Hello Trinity West Seattle, uh, it's Pastor Joel here again and I'm grateful to get to open up God's Word with you right now and we're going to be continuing in this series that we've been in in 1 Thessalonians called Great Affliction, Greater Kingdom and uh, really the way that we've been uh, what we've been seeing in this book is that our ancient brothers and sisters in Christ, that's what I like to call them anyway, they were going through great suffering, some even death, and yet they were part of this kingdom that transcended those circumstances. It even carried them through those circumstances. And so that's where we get the name Great Affliction, Greater Kingdom. And our goal for this series is that we would be a people who live to bring the realities of God's kingdom into our afflictions as well. And so we're going to have someone read the scripture for us, then I will pray and we'll get into it, okay? Good morning. I'm Blossom Storms, and today's scripture is from the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3a and 9 through 12. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Finally then, brothers and sisters, we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received instruction from us about how you must live and please God, as you are in fact living, that you do so more and more. For you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is God's will, that you become holy. Now on the topic of brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you are practicing it towards all the brothers and sisters in all of Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, to aspire to lead a quiet life, to attend to your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. In this way, you will live a decent life before outsiders and not be in need. This is God's word. You may be seated. All right, join me as I pray for us and our time in God's word together. Father, thank you so much for speaking to us. We need you to speak to us. We need to hear from you. And so we pray that as we study your word, you would illuminate our understanding. The Holy Spirit, you transform us and, and minister to us. God, we confess that we are so uh, prone to idleness, to uh, not loving others, but selfishly um, seeking our own comforts. And so we pray, God, that as you have loved us so tremendously, we would become more and more like you. We would be a people who love others more and more, that we would be the family that you have called us to be as your church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are entering now into the third month of stay at home. Can you believe that that's the case? Some of you are going, yeah, I can believe it. It feels like it's the 30th month. <laughs> uh, but what's, what's happened during this time? Well, restlessness has begun to set in. Boredom 
Even idleness has creeped into our lives. I've heard so many people say that they feel like it's Groundhog Day every single day, just the same thing over and over and over again. But is there something that God is up to in the middle of all of this monotony? Is there something that we can learn from him as we experience what I would call a form of affliction? I think so. And and I think that we can see a side of his kingdom that we're normally blind to. I think that we can meet him in ways that we would otherwise ignore. And I think that we can not only survive during this time, but we can actually thrive in the middle of it. What it takes, or part of what it takes to do that, is recognizing the fact that God has made us, as the church, His family. God has adopted us. And what does God's family do? They love one another. That's actually the big idea for today. Because God has made us family, we should love one another. And some of you have been Christians for a really long time and you're going, wow, this is really rudimentary, right? This is like Christianity 101. But the thing is, Christianity 101 is a class we will not graduate from until the return of Jesus, okay? We always, until he comes, are going to be growing and growing in love. Love is not only an idea or an inward disposition. It's so much more than that. Love is an inward uh, reality in our hearts that results in an outward action. And sometimes the most challenging places for us to love are in the most mundane and ordinary parts of our lives, especially our relationships and our work. Now, last week, as as we get into this text here that we're going to be covering today, last week, we saw that in the first part of uh, chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, this section is really teaching us how we're to live until the return of Jesus. And I can imagine that many of you, like I, am just waiting for that day, hoping for that day, praying for that day, come Lord Jesus, especially during this depressing time. Now, verses 1 through 8 focused on how we are to live set apart, really holy lives, especially regarding sexual purity. And now these verses, 9 through 12, are focused on living set apart specifically in love and, and brotherly love. Paul begins this section with a familiar statement. He's used this kind of language many times throughout this letter. Things like, you already know, or as you yourselves know. But in this case, verse 9, Now on the topic of brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And so, the church in Thessalonica it has this incredible thing happening to them, something that had been uh, prophesied and, and spoken of in the Old Testament, that the Holy Spirit has been given to them, and He's actually teaching them how to love. He's working from within their own hearts. God Himself is teaching them how to love one another. And Paul says, you don't have any need for anyone to to write to you about this. I can see that you're loving one another, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. (laughs) I'm going to go ahead and write you about it anyway. Why does he say that? Well, verse 10, indeed, you are practicing it, that's love, toward all the brothers and sisters in all of Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. So they were obviously extending their care and concern beyond their own church family now to the church in the entire region. This would be like us uh, reaching out and helping churches in on the west side of Seattle or uh, really in the whole Puget Sound region. And and though they were showing their love for these other churches, Paul knows that even if we don't need to be taught what love is, We do need to be constantly urged to endure in it. He he actually uses this phrase that he did in the passage last week, more and more, more and more. Even if you're healthy, 
health is not something that you arrive at. It's something that you maintain. This is how love works. This is how relationships work. Uh, let me use a couple of illustrations to explain. First one, I, I love to cook. You, you, many of you know that. And uh, if you've ever cooked, you know that uh, cooking is not something where you can just kind of set it and forget it. You just kind of get something going and walk away. No, it's, it's something that you have to be present for and actively working at while it's happening. If you don't, you can actually ruin the entire meal. And loving relationships are the same way. They require our ongoing attention and care to become healthy, but also to remain healthy. And Jesus uses another illustration. In John chapter 15, he says this about our relationship with him. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. And so our relationship with Jesus is like a branch that needs ongoing connection to a vine in order to survive. It can't survive without it. It can't be fruitful without it. And so whether it's our relationship with God or with the church or with people outside of those circles, we can't just assume that just because they're good at one point, That'll guarantee that they'll remain strong. So Paul knows everyone needs encouragement and he urges the Thessalonians to keep it up. Keep up this growing in love more and more. And then in verse 11, he shares three expressions of godly love. This is what he's urging them to do more and more. It says, to aspire to live a quiet life, to attend to your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. For a number of years, these four verses, 9 through 12, were actually highlighted in my Bible, and I named them. I called them the Hobbit Life. <laughs> the Hobbit Life. Some of you are going, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm not a nerd, so I don't know what hobbits are. But we all know that you've seen the Lord of the Rings movies, so you know what a hobbit is. Don't pretend like you don't know what I'm talking about. These, these creatures who are like, uh, you know, half the size of, of a human being. They, they have those big furry feet <laughs> and, and the pointy ears. And, um, you know, they don't have any facial hair. They're, they're clean shaven. And they're obsessed with kind of not involving themselves in the affairs of the world outside of their immediate community. But more than that, they also wanted to be people who were uh, constantly working the ground. And then, of course, unrelated, but they were also very interested in the brewing of beer and and in smoking of pipes. But that's another story. And so as I describe Hobbit life, wouldn't you say that sounds a bit like what's going on here? I thought so. But then as I studied this passage this week, I realized that I was dead wrong. This, This is definitely not like the Hobbit life. And the reason is the motivation. Hobbits are motivated by comfort, and I would say even laziness at times, idleness, really. But the family of God is motivated by love. We're motivated by love, completely different. And so I think Paul is actually addressing idleness in these verses, which just shows how wrong I was, right? He's actually speaking out against that in a sense by really speaking positively about these three expressions of love. They stand in contrast to idleness. What were those three expressions? You remember what they were? Aspiring to lead a quiet life, attending to your own business, and working with your own hands. Now, if you're anything like me, you hear those and you go, how exactly is that love? How are those expressions of love? I I struggled with this this week as I was preparing. So what does it mean for aspiring to live a quiet life? How how is that love? Well, it means that your life uh, doesn't require significance outside of the significance that God has already given to you. It means that being still or being slow is not only okay, it's actually desirable. 
It means that your soul is quiet, that it's resting in God's love for you and wholly satisfied, not lacking in anything. You, if you're a part of Trinity, and you have been for the past few months at least, you may have heard Pastor Bill Clem's message on Psalm 131. He gave it maybe, I don't know, six, eight weeks ago. Amazing message, did a great job, and he really helped us not only understand what the quiet life is, but uh, desire it, I would say, especially this inward quietness. I'd, I'd encourage you to go check that out. But when you are inwardly quiet, you're resting in God's love for you, you're also more able to be outwardly quiet and loving toward others. You don't need to be at the center of attention. You don't need constant busyness or noise. No, it's quiet. What about attending to your own business? How is that love? Well, really what this is telling us is to mind our own business. Now, normally we hear that as like an angry rebuke, right? But in this case, it's, it's just a gentle command. It's saying, don't meddle in other people's affairs. Focus on your own. Because when we're idle, we don't want to focus on our own business. We, we're bored, right? We, we're dissatisfied when our life isn't going the way that we want it to. Or even, maybe, maybe we're not being idle, but we're overcome by stress or anxiety. In all these kinds of moments, we are prone to involve ourselves in other people's lives in ways that are unhelpful, to, to really fiddle with their stuff. We can become busybodies, gossips even. And interfering with other people's business is stirring up strife. We then contribute to brokenness in relationships. We damage ourselves. We damage others. Whereas aspiring to live a quiet life and to mind our own business actually expresses our love towards others and contributes to the peace and the, the, the harmony of the community. Now, what about working with your own hands. How is that one love? This one might be the hardest one to understand how it's love, unless you understand the context. So let me share the context with you. Think about this. This, this letter was written very early on in the life of the church, maybe 20 years or less after the resurrection of Jesus. The church community was pretty much brand new. But even from the very beginning, we see in the book of Acts that Jesus' followers were generous with each other. They were, they were sharing their possessions. They were giving to those in need. This was crossing um, ethnic boundaries, people who were not like them, who didn't look like them. But it was also crossing social class boundaries. This community just looked altogether different from anything anyone had ever seen before. Why? The answer is because this radical transformation had happened. That each man and each woman had been adopted into the family of God and now they saw one another as brothers and sisters who they loved. They even, some of them, provided for, especially those who had been cast out of their biological families. That had been happening in, in Thessalonica as well. People uh, become Christians and their family disowns them. Who's their community? The, the Christian community in that family. But as with any family, the people within that community uh, who were perfectly capable of working and supporting themselves. Sorry, I'll start that again. There were people within that community who were perfectly capable of working and supporting my, themselves, but they chose not to. They didn't want to. And so the selfishness of idleness actually led to then pla them placing an undue burden on those who were really seeking to be charitable people. people Charitable, man, I'm really having trouble talking here. Uh, people who were seeking to, to bless those in need were being take adv taken advantage of. And, and we're not entirely sure all of what was going on in this dynamic. I mean, some people might have been 
uh, quitting their jobs and stopping working because they thought Jesus was coming back at any moment. I've, I've said that before. And so they're like, well, what's the point of working? But it is pretty clear as you read these, these two letters, First and Second Thessalonians in total, it's pretty clear that some people were lazy. They were just being idle. In, in chapter 5, for example, Paul uh, commands them. He says, admonish the idol. So on the flip side of all of that, how is working with your hands an expression of love? Well, because it shows that you are willing to give of yourself in order to benefit others, first off, with your work, but also that you're willing to give yourself to the benefit of others by not placing an undue burden onto that community. And so, what would the result of all of these three things being lived out be? If, if, peop, if the church family is loving one another by living quietly, by minding our own business and working, what's, what's the result? Verse 12 tells us, In this way, you will live a decent life before outsiders and not be in need. Church, God adopted us because he loves us. And he's given us a purpose that we would be the kind of family that reflects his love, his character. We're really his representatives here on earth. And his reputation is staked on how well we reflect him. And so why would we want to live a decent life before outsiders? Well, we're a church community that's separated from outsiders, but we also want to invite those outsiders in, right? Why would we want to be a people who don't live in need of one another? Well, because we don't want to be the kinds of people who are exploiting the charity of others, the taking advantage of, like we just heard about. But I do want to come back to this whole issue of need in, in just a minute. But let's first just think about what it means to be a family that each does its part so that it's not needy. I want to tell you a story. When I was 18, I, uh, I had this terrible job at an ice creamery. And the owners were really just unpleasant people, bad bosses. And I asked them for some time off. I wanted to go, I think it was take a day off. Going to go drive up to San Francisco. I'm going to go see Radiohead in concert. And they said no. Of course they said no, right? And I did what any good 18-year-old time, 18-year-old at that time would have done, and I just I quit my job. <laughs> I quit right then and there. Maybe not the wisest decision, but at the same time, I don't regret it. I mean, this was the OK Computer Tour, once in a lifetime opportunity, people. If you if you don't know Radiohead, don't worry about it. But it was a great show, a great concert, and and as I got back from that concert over the course of the next days and and weeks and months, really, that ensued, reality set in. At the time, I was living uh, with my friend and his family. I was living in a trailer in their backyard, and I, did, I got super depressed. I was out of work for months afterward. And one day during that whole time, my friend's dad came up to me, and, and he said, Hey, Joel, I want you to mow the lawn. And I said, well, how much are you going to pay me to mow the lawn? And he said, nothing. That's not how our family works. Our family all participates. We all contribute to one another's needs. And we, we all work together. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that's not how my family worked growing up. My, I got paid if I was going to do a chore. <laughs> and so I was, I was pretty flustered and upset about this. But I went out there with the lawnmower and I angrily pushed that thing along, not learning any sort of a lesson in that moment. But in retrospect, I can look back and, and realize that there was an important lesson there. And I, and I think I have learned it now at this point, that in each loving family, each person does their part, and all the more in the church family, right? The way that Ed Welch talks about it is in his book, Side by Side, it, he, he says that we are a people who are needy, but we are also 
needed. That the, the church is not only a family, but it's also the body of Christ. And in a body, all the different parts need one another. So when Paul says, don't be in need, Paul isn't saying it's wrong to need one another. That's the whole essence of the church. He's merely condemning this idleness and laziness that, that was going on when these, these perfectly capable people were unwilling to work. And so let's take all of those things and come out of the theory and bring it into the practical. What exactly does this mean for us? How does this actually apply to us, this whole love and work thing? It's going to look different depending on who you are and, and your life stage and some of these kinds of things. But I, just, I want to give you a few different examples. Do you know that this can apply to you even if you're a stay-at-home mom? Do you know that, moms? This can apply even if you don't have a regular job outside of the home, even if you don't get a paycheck. You can still do your part in the family. You are doing your part in the family by refraining from idleness, by living quietly, by minding your own business, not meddling in other people's affairs, i.e. maybe the neighbors or something like that, by working with your own hands. Moms, I want you to know there is dignity and love in the work that you do. Perhaps, even depending on the age of the kids that you have, that might even involve uh, teaching them how to do work around the household or lovingly delegating tasks to them for each of them to participate in, which actually really easily leads into the next example that I want to give you. Did you know that this can apply to you even if you are a kid or a teenager? Now, if you're a little kid and you're watching this right now, kudos to you. I, I just want to commend you. I mean, there are plenty of adults that don't have a long enough attention span to be here with us through this whole thing. But from when you're a small kid all the way up until right before you leave your parents' house, you can quietly, minding your own business, work and help your family out. Did you know that? And I think this might be easier for the littles, the, the real tiny kids who just want to help just because they want to be with you and they want to do things with you than it is for the teenagers. And so teenagers, I want to kind of give you uh, not a strong word, but I, I do want to encourage you to forego the inclination toward entitlement and laziness. That's what I would have described uh, me in that story that I talked about earlier when I was 18, mowing the lawn. I want to encourage you to use this time right now, teenagers, to train yourself in the love of God by willingly contributing to the family needs. Maybe you need to mow the lawn like I did. Maybe you need to empty the dishwasher. Maybe you need to clean up the dog poop. You know what I'm saying? Maybe you could even do it without being asked to. I'm, I'm saying that part for when my kids watch this message in a couple of days. <laughs> okay, so that's kids and teenagers. How, who else? Did you know that this can even apply to you if you're unemployed? Some of you are going, no way, how is this supposed to apply to me? Take a step back for a second. There are now 38.6 million Americans who have filed for unemployment. It's insane. That's like 25%, a quarter of the U.S. workforce. And I know that some of you are among them. I've heard the stories. I've talked to some of you. And in fact, I was talking with Denise Miller, who's a small business owner in the church, uh, this week. And she was saying that she projects that her business is going to lose 40% of its income this year alone. Who knows what will happen if this stuff goes on? And so I think it's important to clarify the difference between unemployment and idleness, <laughs> okay? There's a huge difference between the two. Paul is not condemning unemployment. You see, idleness is when people can work, there is available work, and they just don't want to do it. Whereas 
Unemployment is when people do want to work and they're unable to for some reason, such as a global pandemic. And so I don't, what I don't want you to hear is shame on you for losing your job or you're not loving people by not being able to find work. No, 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 no. We are in a very, very unique time. And as such, I want to remind you that it is not wrong to be in need. Remember, we were talking about that just a minute ago. The church is, is an interdependent community, right? It's, it's okay to be in need. And so, on the contrary, we as a church are eager to carry and bear one another's burdens as we are also called to do in love. We're commanded to in Scripture. But while you're unemployed or you're furloughed or whatever it is that you're going through, instead of caving to that idleness, turn to the Lord. Turn to the Lord. Invite Him to guide you throughout your day. What is, what's He teaching you in this time, in this quietness, in this slowness? Also, what work can you get done? Maybe it's in your household or uh, it's learning something new so that you can strengthen your resume. Denise, who I mentioned uh, is a small business owner, she's finding ways to not only spend more time with the Lord, but also attack those projects that she otherwise hasn't been able to. If you're out of work, are you discovering what God is up to in the middle of it? That's what I want to encourage you toward. But this also applies to you even if you're retired. Now, that might not seem that surprising because you're like, well, I already learned what a quiet life is like before all this pandemic stuff set in. But at the same time, I'm guessing that idleness is a greater temptation for you than for many of us. And so I want you to know that the work that you do in your house or in your yard or helping with the grandkids or serving those in our church, that's a beautiful reflection of the kind of familial love that we're talking about here. And so don't think for one minute that you're not capable of expressing love in these ways just because you don't have a regular paying job. And last example, did you know that this can apply to you even if your productivity is down? Yeah, yes. Most of us are experiencing this if we still have work and we're, we're able to work right now. Your productivity is down. Your schedule's been turned on its head, you're, whether it's because you're you know, trying to get your kids on a million different Zoom calls uh, throughout the day or just your whole schedule has been turned on its head. Your productivity is down, your daily productivity. I got so frustrated about this this week, church, I was just feeling really frustrated and discouraged about it this week. And it's exhausting. But I need you to know that the inability to work or get things done is also very, very different from the sin of idleness. So don't see yourself in this time as inherently idle. Yes, I'm sure you'll be tempted toward idleness. I've been there. I've even given way to it over the last few weeks at times. But you're not necessarily being idle if you're unable to work or if your life has slowed down. And so instead of condemning yourself for something that you haven't done, take advantage of this time. See what God has for you in the slower, in the quieter life that we've all been kind of forced into, thrust into during this time. I want to close our time remembering the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything always comes back to the gospel. And you know, when we think about Jesus, we think about all the extraordinary things that he did. Uh, he, he's God in the flesh. That's extraordinary. He was born of a virgin. That's extraordinary. He fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. That's extraordinary. He healed diseases and taught with power and authority. That's extraordinary. He died for our sins and triumphed over our enemies. That's extraordinary. He ascended into heaven where he is seated and rule over the entire universe. Doesn't get any more extraordinary than that. And these aspects of Jesus' story are what the Bible really focuses on because it's the gospel. It's Jesus' glory, Jesus' majesty. 
But there's something more to Jesus' story, and it's, it's kind of in between the lines of the New Testament. What went on between the virgin birth and when he inaugurated his kingdom and ministry? There's around 30 years mostly filled with radio static. And during that time, Jesus was just a regular kid. He was just a regular teenager, then a, a regular guy working an ordinary job as a carpenter like his dad, living quietly, minding his own business, working with his hands, loving others. And you know what? I believe that, at, uh, that as his heart was trained in holiness and love through those ordinary days, it actually prepared him for his extraordinary ministry. When he knelt in the garden and prayed, Father, not my will, but your will be done. When he sweat drops of blood, when he endured beatings, when he carried his cross, when he suffered and died, when he accomplished the work of our salvation, I wonder if in his humanity, he couldn't have done that work without having trained in the ordinary quiet work that he did all those years, all those, all those days, all those weeks, all those months, all those years before. Jesus was an example to us in that he was extraordinary, but also in that he was ordinary. He showed us that God doesn't save us into an escape from everyday life. No, he, he saves us into a renewed existence where what we do in the daily grind is just as important as our spiritual life. In fact, they're one and the same. All of life can be an expression of love, not only to our brothers and sisters, but of love and devotion to him. So keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep loving him and others and do so more and more. I want to leave you with two community group questions this week. These are really just here if, if they're helpful to you as you gather virtually with your group to spark your conversation. How have you seen God at work on you in this crazy time? And where are you struggling to endure in love. Let's pray. Father, we again come to you thankful for your word. And we pray as we did earlier, Father, send us your Holy Spirit to transform us that we might be this kind of loving family. We might be this kind of community that shows the world what you are like. Help us to do that more and more, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, church, let's respond now to God in song. Thanks for that word, Pastor Joel. So we're going to respond now to what we've heard. You know, it's the grace of Christ that uh, allows us as Christians to persevere. And it's that same grace that enables us to love and serve each other. So uh, let's sing right now. This is an old hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. I've asked Jaden and Annabelle Lee to help us out, so let's sing loud together. This be the time that our hearts in Christian love.
Good morning, Trinity family. Uh, we are the Williamson family, and we're going to be reading today's benediction. Now, this is my wife, Stacy, and daughter is Katie, Jacqueline, <clears throat> and I'm Brian. Today's reading is out of 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 9. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. It's today's reading. Uh, thank you so much and everyone have a, a beautiful Sunday. Bye.